The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to the Happiness Jungle with yours truly, the Chief Happiness Officer, Lindy Eldridge. You guys are going to be sitting on the edge of your seats. You know how we really don't want to age? Did you ever hear of a vampire facial before? I have got. Oh, am I so excited. You know, when you want to talk to somebody about anything in regards to anti-aging, you want to make sure you trust your source. And I'm excited because I'm bringing somebody to you that I trust so much to share with us all the information about aging, anti-aging. She's a medical doctor. She's inspiring. She now owns a medical spa here in uh, New Hampshire. But she's going to share with us something that's called Vampire Facials, as well as, I'm sure, so much more. Right, mm -hmm. Dr. Lisa? Absolutely. Oh, I'm so excited. Everybody, welcome. Dr. Lisa Vuic. Vuic. Doesn't that just sound exotic in itself? <laughs> and I love you. I love your jewelry. Your jewelry is just full of some good, oh, it, I just, I feel so, I feel very vampirish right now. And I want to take this because there are so many people in our audience that, for lack of a better term, we don't want to age. And we're watching celebrities and we're watching everybody come to looking younger than ever before. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to help the people that are our audience to realize that you don't have to be a celebrity to look good. You can have it. Share with us, and I definitely am very in tune and very excited about the vampire facial. Mm -hmm. Share with us. First of all, you were a medical doctor. Correct. How did you, how, what happened? How, how did all this happen? Because you're brilliant. And any way that you could serve us in the medical profession, I just, I'm excited about it. But what changed in your life? Because that is a big transition. It is. When I initially started my practice, I was in internal medicine, which is an adult medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I trained for. It's what I went to medical school for. You know, it's what I went, did my chief residency in. It's what I went into practice in. And by 2003, I had a private practice after I'd worked in some group practices. So I was basically your general practitioner. Mm. That's the person looking for cancer, the person curing your bronchitis, you know, very different than what I do now. But by 2000, 2003, I opened a private practice. By 2005, there was so much talk about cuts, reimbursement cuts, insurance cuts, and I was running a private practice. I had to, I had to pay my overhead. Mm. I had to survive as a sole practitioner in this world. So I thought, well, let me do something that's cash on the table, something that's going to support the medical practice, mm -hmm. pay some bills that I don't have to fight an insurance company over, right? So that's when I started doing aesthetics. And basically, over the course of many years, I did more and more mm. aesthetics. You know, it got to the point where I was doing, let's say, half-time aesthetics, half-time internal medicine. Oh, wow. You know, which is, a, which is a big change, you know, in itself. And then the field of medicine, honestly, in terms of outpatient medicine, really started to change. And I'm sure most people are aware of, you know, how things are changing, how the practice of medicine is changing, how onerous, you know, the documentation requirements are. You know, doctors are not happy these days, especially in outpatient medicine. Mm. The uncompensated work is escalating. The insurance coverages are becoming more and more complicated. People don't know what their coverage is. Patients are upset. Formularies change every three months. Mm -hmm. I mean, the outpatient practice of medicine started to become something that was not as rewarding yeah. to me. I remember growing up, and I'm going to use TV shows, mm -hmm. <coughs> like Marcus Welby, MD, mm -hmm. like Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And the doctors had such passion. Mm -hmm. And they just loved and they thrived what they do with their black bag going home to home and really making a difference. Yep. 
And I know for a fact that everything that you're saying right now, because growing up I watched the medical profession change, mm -hmm. and I watched the care change, and I watched one doctor go now to different specialists. There's an ear specialist that used to, one doctor used to take care of my grandmother and the kids. Now Absolutely. everybody's different. I mean, we joke in the medical profession, you're going to have an orthopedist for your right leg and a different orthopedist for your left leg huh. because it's breaking down yeah. you know, that much. And more and more of the medical work is being done by what we call mid-level providers, right. you know, nurse practitioners, oh. physician assistants, et cetera. Midwives. So, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. you know, the, the, the field is changing. There's, right. there's a lot of unhappiness. There's mm -hmm. a lot less. I mean, you talk about passion yeah. in, in a career. One of the keys for me to passion in a career is autonomy. It's being able to make the right decision, being able to feel like you're delivering the best care yeah. you know, to the person that you're treating. And what's happening in medicine is autonomy is dwindling. Mm -hmm. you know, your hands are tied. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like someone giving you a box of crayons and saying there's 32 colors. You can use three of them. That's right. the formulary. And it's, oh, what it's, a good analogy. It's, it's frustrating sure. because you know you know, there's that many other crayons, and five of them are a lot better choice for that particular patient. Right. But you've got three to deal with. And it got to the point in outpatient medicine where at least half of my visits were sitting down with people. Oh, it's been three months. The formulary has changed. None of my meds are covered. Now what are we going to do? Right. Now what are we going to do? Now what are we going to do? And I'm like, really? This is not creative. Mm. This is not a challenge. You're no longer this serving. Is, this is, I, I'm, I'm, Playing a game. It felt more oh. and more and more like I was playing a game where I wasn't in control of the rules and the decision I could make was not necessarily the best decision. I wasn't being given all the tools that I'd like to be given. Like this is this is not satisfying for me. It's frustrating for me. It's wow. frustrating for the patient for me to sit there and say, Well, let's play the formulary game again. Right. You know. And then people were because, you know, and right about the time when I left, Obamacare was kicking in. Now, we won't get into a political discussion, but right. let me tell you, <clears throat> I saw the writing on the wall. Right. I'm like, this is just going to get worse, not better. Right. So, you know, I, I ultimately... You made a decision. You shifted, but you loved I the shifted. medical industry, and you I, stayed in it. I did. I stayed yeah. in it a very long time. I, I switched from... The outpatient medical world, which was getting much more restrictive to inpatient, you know, rehab hospital rounds. And that I enjoyed, very yeah. critically ill patients. But there again, the field of medicine was changing. The companies I was working for, let's say as an independent contractor, were starting to take physician shifts and put nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in them and not the doctors. Oh, wow. And, you know, there would be a doctor... You on know, premise. Not necessarily <gasps> on premise. Just in, you know, someone you could call if you had a problem kind of thing. You know, it just, so I was at a crossroads where, okay, I can either go out and search for another inpatient internal medicine opportunity or I can take the leap and do what feels like I'm making more of an impact and do what feels like, you know, I'm enjoying myself yeah. because, I, you know, it was getting to be difficult really to enjoy what I was doing. So it wasn't easy. I mean, it definitely felt like, you know, a big mental pause because at the time, aesthetics was not paying my salary. Mm. And I was going through a nasty divorce. Right. I had a young child at the time. You know, three year marriage, four and a half year divorce. Oh That's my what gosh. I was in the middle of. And it was brutal. And I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to make, but I know this. You know, if I don't completely devote myself to this aesthetics practice, it's, it's never going to be what I want it mm. to be. So I either need to take a plunge or not. The most cru critical, hardest time of your life, mm -hmm. you made it also a professional shift. Mm -hmm. Wow. It felt like jumping off a cliff. <clears throat> cliff. It, so how many of really? you feel like you're jumping off a cliff? How many of you realize that there are obstacles that, you're just going to have to take that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. If it feels good, do it. That's what you did. Huh. That is, that's, that's a wow. Mm -hmm. That's a wow. You totally left a comfort zone and said no. Absolutely. Left yeah. my comfort zone in a big way. It in took a... me weeks to, it was like an identity mm -hmm. shock. Huh. 
because I had spent all of my time from the time I was in high school preparing to be a physician thinking I'm going to be the doctor in right. the hospital, the one you see on TV, right? right? right. <laughs> Not the one you see on Botched. <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to be the one saving lives and curing right. cancer and all this other stuff. I'm not, it wasn't about aesthetics in my head, right. you know, so it was interesting. Yes. But then my colleagues ask me now, do you miss it? I'm like, uh-uh. No, you love what you I do I love now. what I do. Because, you know, I, I get to, um, periodically, we, we get to talk. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. And we really just met. Mm -hmm. I was just so inspired. We met by uh, Dr. Sharon Liv, mm -hmm. who is just an amazing person within herself. She's a force. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> She's a very good force. And... Uh, but what, but, but what I have learned about you is that you just don't do it just to create an income. You do it because it's impacting people, mm -hmm. you know, and changing their lives. And I'm not even going to just say women because mm -hmm. there's, more, there's men out there that are so vain, mm -hmm. right, and want to mm -hmm. change and feel better and look better because they go through their stuff too. Mm -hmm. What is the youngest? What is your youngest? You know, I'd say... For what I do yeah. um, at the Meta Spa, probably the youngest person I'm treating would be 28, yeah. you know, late 20s. Right. Because most of my time is laser and injectables, and that's usually, you know, if I'm treating someone in their late 20s, it's usually either because they want a little more plump lip okay. or because they have acne scarring. Oh. And they're treating the acne scarring. Okay. That's, that's huge. Um, so... As we get into the older years, the late 30s, the 40s, yeah. the 50s, et cetera, then it's a lot more about correcting volume loss and collagen loss in the face. Okay, I like that. And mm -hmm. I like how we just broke that up because there are, there are people out there that have that scarring from the mm -hmm. acne. Mm -hmm. And they think that they're stuck with it for life. Correct. And they're not. And they don't need to be. And it, they it don't takes, need to be. It takes a combination approach, but it's absolutely right. something that can be improved. And that is absolutely life-changing. Yeah, for people. I mean, the, the acne scarring is, is horrendous. Right. If, if you have it, it's your self-esteem. Yeah. yeah. Really. And you talk, I mean, you mentioned the V word. We call it the V word in aesthetics, yeah. right? Vanity. Right. You know, a lot of times I'll be treating people, they'll be like, oh, I'm so vain. I know I shouldn't be so vain. I'm like, wait a minute. A little vanity is a good thing. Right. Seriously. We've all looked around us. We know people who've got no vanity whatsoever. Yeah. And this is the thing. It's not just about their face. They let everything go. That's right. They let their weight go. They let their health everything. go. They, everything. They, they don't exercise. They, they're, they're not healthy in general. Right. And that's not a good thing. We need a little bit of vanity. Mm -hmm. We don't need to look artificial. Right. We don't need to look fake. Right. But it's good to care. That's right. Yeah. I love that. I love that you said mm -hmm. that because no matter what's going on on the inside, mm -hmm. and that's why I share with my audience you need to wake up and you need to take a shower. That's right. number one. You need to cleanse that outside mm -hmm. so you feel better. It's the same thing as what you do, is you give people the permission to wake up, feel alive, and feel rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. Correct. <clears throat> and because of the outside shell, the inside shell just takes a whole different personality. Right. You know, and you get to, you literally get to witness that. I do, which <sighs> is most of the fun of what I do. Mm-hmm. And then, so now you found happiness through your profession. Mm -hmm. You now have, and we got to talk about this because it is crazy. You guys have got to, you, you have to, you, you're on, on YouTube because mm -hmm. I watched your procedure mm -hmm. and I said, I've got to know more about the yeah. vampire facial because it just sounds intriguing. How is it possible that we humans have anything to do with vampiring? Share, share that, and then we'll let everybody know what you're going to be doing. So, so the vampire procedure, when you use the term vampire in aesthetics, basically what you're talking about is that you are taking growth factor, which you've derived from that person's blood, from right. a blood draw. You've concentrated that blood down. You've taken out just the platelet-rich portion of the blood, and this requires a multi-step centrifuge and, you know, all the right equipment. So you get rid of the red cells, you get rid of most of the water. And you do all this? Oh, yeah, yeah. And right at the same time, <laughs> you take only the portion of that blood sample which contains the platelets, which contain most of our growth factors, and then you use the growth factors for rejuvenation. And you can use them in a lot of different ways. Okay. And this, honestly, this is the buzzword for people. People like vampire procedures because 
to them, it's a lot more of a natural approach because ah. I'm harnessing the power of my own growth factors. It's not someone else's growth factor. It's not a neonatal growth factor. It's, it's just I'm taking what's already in my body uh -huh. and delivering it to a different location in my body to stimulate tissue growth. Wow. So vampire just means it involves a blood draw. Right. Well, it's intriguing and mm -hmm. it makes people want it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, so... We have spoken about the vampire facial, mm -hmm. and I think that I have agreed and that mm -hmm. we are going to do the procedure on me, mm -hmm. and it's all going to be videoed Correct. so we could watch the transformation. Well, let's, let, let's create a distinction here. The vampire facial uses the platelet-rich plasma, or PRP as we yeah. call it, on the surface, right. okay, along with a procedure called microneedling to stimulate some collagen. Okay. But what I propose for you is the vampire face lift. Hello. You know, it is very intimidating city here with you. I have all these lights. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, yeah. it, it's like, it's, it's very intimidating. So it's kind of like I want to sit back and I just want to go, okay, if I, if I go here, but I'm, I guess I'm excited because I have a professional in front of me that truly cares mm -hmm. and wants to make that difference. So, and you're not afraid to use the words that I need to hear. And I like that and I appreciate it. The, the, the key is this, and this is the position I operate from. In the Northeast, we don't want to look fake. Right. We don't want to look like stuffed. We don't right. want to look like we've got sausage lips. We don't want to look like we've got cheeks that enter the room before us, right? Amen. I mean, we, yeah. But more refreshed. Yes. We want to look you know, on the outside, like we feel on the inside. Yeah. If we could look 10 or 12 years younger, mm -hmm. that's good. Right. I don't, I don't see people who are 50 and want to look 20. It's not. Exactly. That's, it's, that's not what I that's do. That's right. What I do is I look at the face like a canvas mm. every time I start. I mark, I look, I think, I plan, mm -hmm. you know, and then whether I'm using Botox, filler, platelet-rich plasma, right. a combination of all three, which is probably what you're getting. Oh. Um, we're just looking to turn back the clock yeah. a little bit. And then when you look in the mirror, you're like, wow. Why did I reject? Darn it. I'm looking pretty good today. Right. You know, this yeah. is, I feel fresh. I look yes. fresh. Yeah. I have fewer lines. My eyes look more open. Right. Um, yeah. My skin is glowing. There's no bad to that. That's a no bad. You know. Can we talk about Botox? Because mm -hmm. people, they hear Botox and they immediately think it's poison. What are we doing? What, what, we need to be educated. Yeah. Because now, from what I understand, Botox is being used for so many different mm -hmm. things. So from something that came from it's horrible, it's bad, it's... it's why, why is this mindset changing? What's important to understand about Botox is... I could take three vials of Botox, mm -hmm. mainline them in your arm, and I, I would maybe make you a little ill. Uh -huh. All right. It, Botox has been used cosmetically since the 1970s. All right. We're using very small doses in the face mm -hmm. to relax muscle enough that you don't have that angry 11 yeah. uh, or angry 1 Right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, <I> um, <laughs> to soften fine lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be vain. Uh, you know, the, the amount of Botox that's injected in the face, right. really, cosmetically, is not enough to cause a problem distantly in the right. body. What so, about all of these, these horrible um, experiences that people are having? When, they have Botox parties and all mm -hmm. of these, oh. When you relax muscles you don't want to relax, well, then you have another problem. But it's a localized problem. You can drop eyebrows. You can make the eye look closed. You can, I mean, you can do anything. You can overdo anything, and you can do anything wrong. Sure. So, you know, the issue with Botox parties is, well, if the Botox party is being done by, you know, a professional, an experienced professional, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. But a lot of the times Botox parties are being done by people who don't have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to make somebody sick. It's not going to be anything dangerous, right. but it may aesthetically be not what you're looking for. Correct. So ultimately, Botox is a purified protein. It's not harmful. It, rela it, it, it interrupts the connection, the communication, if you mm -hmm. will, between nerves and muscles. 
but you need to be relaxing the right muscle or you're not yeah. going to get the look you're looking for. When you see or read about complications, difficulty swallowing, I mean, distant complications, you have to understand that Botox is also used in much larger doses in cerebral palsy, you know, in muscular dystrophy. Sure, when you're using 500 units of Botox in a really large vascular area, right. well, then maybe, you know, there's enough toxin there that if there's a complication, there's going to be trouble breathing. But that's not what we deal with in aesthetics. Right. Wow. So fascinating, because what people think and what, what, what's, a, what's true at fact is completely different, you know? It's, it's confusing, and, and a lot of times people will call and say, I need an appointment for filler, and really what they're looking for is Botox, or I need a Botox yeah. appointment, and then they get there, and it's like, no, that's not a Botox thing, that's a filler thing. And, and we understand that. I mean, the, right. part of our job as aesthetic providers, if you will, is to help you, you know, if you do this well, negotiate the field of aesthetics. I mean, right. it's very difficult to know what should I do, in what order, how many things should I do, right. what's going to be the best bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. We get that a lot. Well, what would you do looking at my face and this is what I've got to work with. I right. work with people within budgets all the time. I mean, that's part of the art, really, is trying yeah. to help people do things gradually right. and do things within their budget that are going to make a big enough difference. I like that. I like that a lot because, they're, you know, people spend their money the way they want to spend their money, whether it's on a tattoo, cigarettes, drinking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. however they want to spend their money. Yep. So people will make an investment within themselves when they want to make that investment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love. And I love that, you know, I've been in the cosmetology field for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I used to own a salon spa down in South Florida. Mm -hmm. Every other corner has a med spa. Mm -hmm. There's one spa, and I, I took a picture of it. I couldn't believe it. It said... Botox 101 for dummies, no appointment necessary. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my God. You know, and I'm watching people walk in and yeah, I'm yeah. like, people beware, right? Right, right. I mean, I'll, you know, it, you have to understand that there's a lot of art yeah. to this. I mean, there are simple injections and there are more complicated injections. Right. So sometimes people will call and say, well, what's the best filler? Well, you know, the place down the street is charging $50 less than you. And I want to talk about that yeah. because people are, like, price shopping. Yeah. Well, you can, you can do that, but, you know, so people say, what's the best filler? What's the cheapest filler? I'm like, don't worry about what's in the syringe. Right. Worry about who's standing behind the syringe. Ooh. Seriously. Yeah. Think about it. It's not a time to price shop. You have to focus on the skill. You have to repeat that because that right there was the <laughs> answer to don't price shop your no. beauty. No. <laughs> we get calls sometimes. People will say, well, the person down the street is $50 cheaper than you. Right. Will you match their price? Yes. I'm like, listen, we're not selling widgets. <laughs> we're not selling widgets. You're, you, th this is an art, right. and our prices are very competitive. Sure. Uh, truly, we are not overpriced. Um, I, I, that's my goal, that yeah. we are you know, very reasonably priced. I'm like... That's right. You know, this is an art. You're paying for the skill of the artist. Think about it. If mm -hmm. you've got someone else you want to go to and you've been happy there before and they're $50 cheaper, knock yourself out. That's right. But if you're going to go to a place cold because it's $50 cheaper. And they got a coupon. And you got a good. Do not group on Botox. Oh, do not group on. And especially do not group on filler. <laughs> do not group on fillers. Do not group on Botox. Like, do your right. homework. It's just do one of the homework. You, you have to do your homework. You need an artist. That's the thing. If you're going for aesthetics, right. you need an artist. And you need a place that does more than one treatment. Yes. I see this all the time. People come to me and they're like, I just spent $3,000 on this other treatment. And I right. look at them and I'm like, "Why? that treatment was never going to get you what you're telling me your goal yeah. was. You spent the money. You went to this place. They offered you the treatment because that's the only thing they did. Right. And unfortunately, I, we do that treatment too, and I would have never offered it to they you. They saw you coming. Right, because it's, right. it's not strong enough for you. It's right. not enough. So do you do your own consultations? I do. I do free consultations. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many times that, and I've seen it done, where you go for a consultation, you're not even talking to the doctor. Right, right. You're it's talking like, to a marketing person. How, like can you, how can that happen? Mm -hmm. And people are okay with that. Mm -mm. And you'll meet the doctor during the procedure. Right. But who's doing the injection? Oh, the doctor. But he hasn't seen me. He hasn't felt me. He hasn't seen my skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't even know my name. Mm -hmm. 
So how is that? How is that? I'm scared. You know, that's crazy. You even meet your surgeon before you have surgery, for right. goodness sakes. Right. So from going from one room to another. So I ask that of you because I want people to realize that you are so unique. You are so personable. Mm -hmm. And you are worth traveling for. Mm -hmm. So and that and people do that. And I want them to know that you exist. Think that's, of it this way. Your face, again, I'll use the word should be viewed as a canvas. Yes. You're selecting an artist. Mm -hmm. You're not just picking a place that has X brand of filler. Right. Or Botox or right. vampire facials or skin tightening or yeah. whatever it is. You need to be comfortable with that person, with Correct. the artist. I mean, you wouldn't buy a picture from someone right. sight unseen, you know, without even... Right. It just... It just if you think about it that way, I think it will make sense. You'll make That's the right true. decision. Well, looking at you, you're absolutely beautiful. You're definitely a product of your product. I and am I'm so... 50. <laughs> are you really? I am really. Oh, you see now, I would not okay. have pegged that. We are running out of time. I want another 30 minutes. <laughs> of course. So what I would like to do is please share with the audience how they can get a hold of you, the name of your salon, mm -hmm. where it's located, because this is going to be syndicated, and you just might have fly-in clients there from now are. on. Yeah. So Renew Metaspa is located in Wyndham, New Hampshire, on Route 111. The uh, website is www.renewmetaspa.com, yeah. and they can call 894-0070. That's area code 603 to make a consult. That's fabulous. Or and online. I love it. And you will be seeing me going through that procedure. So we already lined up the videographer, and now we just have to set the date, and you will watch me do a transformation, and I'm pretty excited about it. Vampire facelift coming to you. Vampire facelift lift. coming. Lift. Lift. <laughs> and there we have it. With that, everybody, we never said that life was easy, but we did say you can be happier, and there's no reason why you can't feel good in the skin on the outside as well as on the inside. And now that we know the facts about what we need to do to do our homework, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're doing it the right way, well, then you might think that it's worth your trip to Wyndham, New Hampshire, to visit Dr. Lisa. Huh? Spell your last name. V-U-I-C-H. Mm, I love it. So with that, everybody, we're going to be closing off. Any last words of wisdom that you would like to give our audience? You're beautiful. My job is to enhance your natural beauty. Mm. And with that, everybody, feel good in your skin. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.